Hey, welcome to Oasis Church Online. I'm Greg Myers, worship leader here, and uh, we're so glad that you've joined us today, and uh, we're looking forward to what God's going to do and hope you experience real life in Jesus through the worship time. So won't you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the day. God, we thank you for who you are. You are almighty God, and we look forward to worshiping you this morning at Oasis Church. God, I pray that uh, you just uh, work in our hearts. God, uh, uh, just speak to us uh, through the music and through the word today. We look forward to what you're going to do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Glad you're with us here this morning. I feel it in my bones, you're about to move. I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So come.
So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Oasis Church Online. I'm Pastor Bob, and I'll be leading this this morning as we get ready to close up our teaching in the book of 1 John. We have this morning's message and then next week's, and then we'll be transitioning, believe it or not, to our Christmas series. Oh, I can't wait for that. Matter of fact, we're going to have a promo for Christmas coming up pretty quick, so you want to make sure that you stay tuned for that. Last week, we covered a key verse that I hope every person listening today hears and understands. It is one of my all-time favorite verses uh, coming from the book of 1 John. It's talking about us knowing that we have eternal life. Now, if you missed that message, I want you to just go ahead right now and stop this video and go back and listen to the message from last week, because this message actually builds on what we talked about last week, that every single one of us, true believers, should know that we know that we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Now, when we're confident in our salvation, that's when these next verses should be pretty important to us. Now, let's begin by just reading a couple of those verses, verses 14 and 15 of 1 John chapter 5. All right, here we go. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. It's important there. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Now, John is pretty clear. He wants us to have confidence in our salvation, and he wants us to have confidence in our prayers. When we understand that, we can approach God with boldness and assurance in our prayer life. So let me ask you a couple questions this morning. How is your prayer life? Matter of fact, let me just ask you a sports question. What's your prayer batting average? I mean, in Major League Baseball, if a player can hit three out of ten baseballs, that's the most valuable player. But what about your prayer batting average? Is God answering your prayers? Are your prayers going to God? I mean, don't you think that God wants our prayers answered more than a three out of ten? I think so. But you do realize that there are some things that can hinder our prayers. I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about a few of those things because I know that you probably want your prayers answered. I know I want mine answered. I know I want God to hear my prayer requests, and I know I want God to answer my prayer requests as well. So here's a few things that can hinder us. First of all, when we ask for the wrong things. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says that we're supposed to seek the kingdom of God first. We're supposed to be asking things that go in accordance with the kingdom of God. Now, I guess that goes my $20 million retirement and my Lamborghini and my upgrade in a bass boat, um, because we're supposed to be asking for things that, again, further the kingdom of God. The next thing that can hinder our prayers, um, where God would not maybe hear or answer, you know, when we're asking for the wrong motives. In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on our pleasures. And it's hard sometimes, but we ask with selfish motivation. We ask more or less, my will be done instead of God's will. So, okay, we can ask for the wrong things. We can ask for um, the wrong motives, The third thing is the one that we talk about a lot is, well, when there's a lot of sin in your life. See, God's not obligated to answer our prayer requests or even hear our prayer requests if we have sin in our life. I was thinking about this, and I I use this verse a lot when I'm talking with couples and that are getting ready to get married, and, and I look right at the guy, okay? And I say, you know, you want your prayers answered, right? And almost everybody says, yes, of course they do. But you do realize that the Bible says that we're to seek to live with our wife in an understanding manner. And then it goes on to say, so that our prayers won't be hindered. In other words, guys, if we're not living with our wives in an understanding manner, understanding where they're coming from, uh, the the Bible says that our prayers are going to be hindered. But they can also be hindered because of sin. When we're blatantly sinning before God, 
Now, keep this in mind. When we sin, it could be conscious sins, it could be unconscious sins, sins that you've forgotten about, and, and, and careful of this, we, we never talk about this. This could be sins that actually, what we call generational sins, can keep your prayers hindered before God. Sometimes not having enough faith keeps our prayer life down around that two or three range when God expects us to have an eight, nine, or ten. And we don't have enough faith. You know, the, the Bible says um, in Matthew chapter 21, it says that we're supposed to pray without doubt. Okay? Pray without doubt. And when, when we do pray, we're to pray as if our prayers can move mountains. Now, how amazing would that be today in your prayer life to be able to move mountains? You know, I was wondering... Why is it that the apostles had this amazing prayer life and did some amazing things? Maybe it's because they had an amazing faith. Maybe they didn't pray just hoping something would happen, or maybe something would happen. They believed in faith in an almighty God that what they prayed for was going to happen because it was God's will. Fifth thing I was thinking about is, you know, a lot of times when we pray, we're not listening. Yeah, man, this is really so true in our life because we're busy people. I don't care whether we're in the middle of a COVID shutdown or not. We still stay busy, running from thing to thing, doing a hundred different things at one time. And it really does make it kind of difficult sometimes to stop and hear the still small voice of God. Sometimes God has answered our prayers in that still small voice and we're not listening. Well, the last thing I want to talk about, you know, that can hinder our prayers, and this is probably the one that we're most guilty of, you really haven't asked. You know, we talk about prayer, okay, and we say that we ought to pray, and you know, but we never really do it. We never sit down and, and communicate. Look, if I know that I can have confidence before God that He hears my requests, as a matter of fact, in John's writing in his Gospels, he says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But it needs to be inside of what? God's will. And I think we'd not spend a whole lot more time praying about it than talking about it. So we can have confidence before God that we can go to him in prayer. We can have confidence that God hears our prayer requests. And we can have confidence that God will answer his prayers when we pray according to his will. Now that brings up a good topic. Let's kind of just a, take a, a side trip for just a second. A lot of times people ask, what is God's will? Well, there are a few things that are God's will that we ought to make sure that we understand when we begin to pray. First of all, his will is that every single person be saved. That's his will, that he wants all mankind to be saved. Now, we realize that, unfortunately, that's not going to happen. But his will is that everyone be saved. His will is that we live an obedient life, that we walk like Jesus walked. We walk pure. We walk with thanksgiving. We walk in submission to his leadership. We walk grateful to who he is for our life. So that's God's will for our life. So when we pray... We're praying, actually asking ourselves to be aligned to God's will. Now, John comes out of the blue with these next couple of verses, or, or does he? We'll find out here in just a second. And if we read these verses, and we're going to read these kind of slow this morning because they get a little bit complicated, and they're kind of a tongue twister as well. But I want you to see what he says here because I think um, this is really important. So let's go on now in verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Now, I'm going to do something I don't normally do. I want to read that one more time in a different translation. This is the contemporary English version. Okay, here we go. It says, suppose you see one of our people commit a sin that isn't a deadly sin. 
you can pray, and that person will be given eternal life. But the sin must not be the one that is deadly. Everything that is wrong is sin, but not all sins are deadly. Now, let me see if I can do my best to help us understand this passage, because if you read this, it kind of says, man, where is he coming up with this? I mean, we're talking about knowing that we can have eternal life, we're having confidence that we can approach God with our prayers, and now we're talking about sin and sin leading to death and praying for people who are committing sin. Well, as long as I can remember, um, in this body or in the flesh, we're all going to be prone to sin, and we're all going to fail when it comes to God's standard. Now, I pray the closer that we get to God, uh, the chance and tendency to, to remain in sin hopefully dwindles. John specifically talks about a person in sin which is not unto death, and we have a responsibility here to pray for that person, which is a little bit different than what people like to do. When we see our brother or sister, or as the one translation said, our people caught in sin, uh, sometimes we judge them, sometimes we condemn them, um, but we have a responsibility, and our first step ought to be is to pray for them. I cannot tell you the importance of praying for one another. There's a tremendous need to pray and not gossip, to pray and not condemn to pray and not judge. We are expected to pray for them. That's what John says. We don't amputate them from the body. We don't cast them aside, but we pray that they will be mended by God and brought back into a right relationship. We pray for repentance and forgiveness for those who have sinned, and that would be almost every single one of us. Now, John does say that there is a sin leading unto death. Now, I don't personally believe that he's talking about the unpardonable sin. Now, a lot of people think that that could possibly be what John is talking about, but he's writing this to believers. He's not writing this to the general public. He's writing this to believers. And I personally don't believe that a Christian, a true believer, can commit the unpardonable sin. Now, I know somebody out there is going to ask, what is the unpardonable sin? It's really not the topic of today, but let me just briefly touch bases on it. The unpardonable sin is when somebody blasphemes against the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, that helped me a whole lot. What does it mean to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? It means to reject the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was sent here to convict the world of the need of a Savior. When we say, I don't need a Savior, when we say we don't need a God, and when we say we can do it on our own, we are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, that unpardonable sin, um, it's a great topic, but it's really not our topic today because I don't believe in context this is what John is talking about. But he does imply that there is a sin that leads unto death. And I don't know about you, if there's a sin out there that can lead unto death, don't you want to know what it is? Well, I do, okay. But I'm not sure that we're going to find out the exact sin. What we are going to find out, okay, is that there is a sin or there are sins out there that could end your life prematurely. Can a brother or a sister get into sin that can shorten your lifespan? Absolutely. Is it possible that a genuinely born again can get into a habitual, unrepentant sin? Well, of course we can. It's hard to think in those terms, but it's possible. And it's also right in line with some writings in the New Testament. Maybe you're familiar with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They lied okay? They were Christians. They were helping the New Testament church, and they lied. And even though it appeared that they believers, their lives were taken from them because of their sin. Paul also referred to in the Bible of people's lives who were cut short because they ate of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And it says that they were asleep or dead. God called them home. 
what we would call in our life, maybe a premature death. See, they crossed the line, like I like to say, they crossed the line where God said, I need a face-to-face with you. They had hurt the uh, the reputation of the church. Maybe they had hurt the reputation of God. And God said, it's time to come home. Because again, worldwide redemption, the, the, the church of God is his bride. And when we get in the way and we're unrepentant of it, we can understand that God may call us home. And what John is saying here, okay, is not all sin is that way. There are sins that can lead to death, and there are sins that are, well, I don't want to minimize sin, but that don't lead to death. But all sin, and I love what he says in verse 17, all sin, okay, is bad. Now, let me tell you what this is not saying. Because you and I, we're not God, okay? You and I, it almost sounds like, you know, we're not to pray for those people who get into sin. And I'm going to tell you something. You don't know whether someone has crossed the line or not. What John is saying is this is, this is a God thing. If God chooses to bring someone home because of their sin, uh, that's up to God, okay? And you're not going to change that. It's just like You're not going to change someone's salvation. But what we can do and what we ought to be doing, and this is why these verses work together, is we ought to pray for them. We ought to be lifting them up in prayer. There's always, as someone has breath, there's always an opportunity for repentance, restoration, and fellowship with God. Now, John closes this book, and he says there's one more thing that I want to say, it's found right there at the end of verse 17. It says that all sin is serious. This is a passage that we ought to be really careful about because God is not pleased for us as believers to be in sin. He doesn't condone sin. As a matter of fact, he won't have fellowship with someone in sin. He sent his only begotten son, his son, to die on the cross that we all right, could be brought into a right relationship with him. And we should never wink at, flirt with, or overlook sin, because all sin had to be atoned for. And for a believer, it's really dangerous to dabble in sin. So there you have it. We can be sure of our salvation, and we can be confident before God that we can go to him in prayer to pray for whatever is that is of God's will and know that God hears our prayer requests. Now, I didn't get into this, but you know, okay, that God doesn't always answer your prayer request the way you think he should. Matter of fact, there was a great article I was reading that says God is always going to answer his prayer request for his good, for his kingdom. And so if we're not aligned to that, we shouldn't be surprised that God's not answering our prayers the way we would want him. But then again, we're to pray his will, not my will. All right, that's what the scripture said this morning. We got one more verse, or one more week coming up in this passage, okay, in 1 John. And then again, we're off to our Christmas um, Moss series, all right? We'll explain that a little bit later on. So let me pray, and then uh, I'll see you next week. Father God, thank you for our morning. Thank you for your word. Father, thank you even for the difficult and hard parts of it, Lord, that, you know, sometimes that don't make a whole lot of sense. Whether we ought to pray or not pray and sins and sins not leading to death. God, thank you again for your Holy Spirit who is our teacher. God, thank you that we can be confident as as true believers that we can approach you anytime, anywhere, and that our prayer requests are heard by you. God, I pray that you'll take this word and you'll bless it over and over. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you guys and see you next week.